This is From the Courtroom to the Boardroom, the podcast for the next generation of legal leaders with me, Simon Gibson. I was a lawyer for 13 years until I walked away from legal practice and entered the world of business. I'm now CEO of the Spirant Group and I lead a portfolio of businesses in the UK and Australia. On this upbeat podcast, I tackle the big issues facing law firms and businesses alike with the help of intriguing guests. Are you ready to rewrite the script? Then it's great to have you along for the ride. Hello, friends. Welcome. Hope you're well. This is from the courtroom to the boardroom. I'm Simon Gibson. And today we're talking about what it's like to be new to the legal sector. What an entry to the legal sector looks and feels like. Well, I'm sort of in a slightly different boat because I've gone from the legal sector into my current role in in legal tech. Um, My guest this week is Abigail Bramwell who's taken a slightly different route. Like me, she's one of the leaders in Integrate, um, our business which uh, looks after the software for the legal profession. However, Abby's not got a legal background, so we're both coming at this as newbies to the legal tech space, but me from legal, Abby from some very different uh, areas of work. So there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what working with lawyers and with law firms is, is, is all about. We hear ourselves referred to as dinosaurs. I'm saying we because I'm still a lawyer myself and I'm very proud to be. We hear that there's very slow uptake for new technology. I've always thought that was a little bit unfair. I think there's lots of reasons why lawyers have to be cautious in terms of when they're bringing new technology into their business and uh, and particularly around things like regulation and client expectations. So this is a real dive into what it's like to be new into the legal tech space. Um, that's with me, Simon Gibson, and my guest, Abigail Branwell, who is here. Hi, Abby. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Good. Thanks for doing this. No problem. So you've been in Integrate now for, it's it's almost a year to the day, isn't it? It's not, not I far. Think, I think it's just a bit over a year, actually. I think I started last October. So. And what, what it, you've obviously, you're, you're head of business development at Integrate. Mm-hmm. And I know, obviously, because we know each other, we work together, I know you've always been in, in business development and sales. What what sort of sectors and, and, and industries have you worked in before? So I worked in hospitality for about four and a half years. Um, and then I sort of took a, a little bit of a different route and worked for a payroll, payroll company, um, and then went back into to hospitality. So it's been quite a a range, um, but focusing on sort of different areas of the business, um, all still for tech companies. Right, got you. So you, you you knew tech, but just not necessarily legal tech. Yeah. Well, when when people think about business development and sales, it, it's got a bit of a stigma attached to it mm-hmm. sometimes, haven't it? People people don't like being sold to. They they nope. they, they get quite. Um, uh, they get quite irate sometimes if they feel that they're getting a hard sell. I think particularly in, in, in the world of professionals, that's particularly the case. What what is what does good sales or good business development look like? What are the key key aspects to it? So I definitely think you've hit the nail on the head. No one wants to be sold to, uh, including me. No. Uh, I always obviously spot the signs, but um, I think you know it's about really establishing the need. Um, and often I do that very sort of conversationally. It's not any sort of direct questions. It's more of just establishing uh, needs and, and pain points and looking to um, looking to sort of navigate around those and, and deliver a solution. Um, That's interesting you've said about pain points because I think this, when I was running a law firm, when I was a lawyer, I thought this was one area which tech companies got wrong, even mm-hmm. those which have got really good products and really good solutions, mm-hmm. that they focus much too much on the solutions and the products rather than the pain. Yeah. So when a law firm is considering improving their technology, they're not doing it just because they want something new. No. They're not even doing it because they want, they want something which is better than what they've got. I mean, that might be part of it, but just because someone can say, oh, you've got System X, well, our system's a lot better than System X, that doesn't matter. They want a particular pain to be cured and eased. 
Mm-hmm. And I think it's interesting that you, you, you've highlighted that in terms of it being quite a high priority. Yeah. I think that the, the main thing is that, you know, no business is the same. No two businesses are the same. So, you know, often out of the box solutions isn't just a one size fits all. There's always going to be sort of bespoke requirements around those. Um, uh, you know, as you say, one product, just because you've got one product and uh, another product is going to do the, the same thing, but it's better. It's actually more so about making sure products are agile to use the elements of it that you wish and that you need sort of improvements on, um, which again comes back to establishing pain points and, and really doing that fact find. And do you find that law firms, and, and I know that obviously we at Integrate, we work with the whole legal ecosystem, not mm-hmm. just law firms. Do you find law firms are quite open about what their pain is at the moment? Yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's, it's a good conversation to have about pain. There's always improvements that can be made. Um, but again, it's how you get to that that end goal. And, you know, often when we speak to firms, they're needing the guidance because obviously legal tech is what we do. It's a question of they know what they need to do and what they need from the software, but it's how you get there. So having that, that clear guidance you know, delivered by a team that have got the experience, there's often quite a lot of comfort and, you know, it's welcomed. And there's such a lot of um, detail involved in Mm. legal practice Mm -hmm. or supporting a legal practice, which is what some of our clients do. As a newcomer to both legal and, and legal tech, how difficult was it in those very early days to sort of get an, get an understanding of, of what the pain points are. Let, let me just use an example. When I'm having conversations with both our clients and prospective clients and, and partners in the industry, one of the things that's always mentioned is operational efficiency. Mm-hmm. And what people will talk about is things like, we want to be able to onboard clients quicker. We want to reduce the amount of time that team members spend doing quite administrative processes. Um, and there's parts of that which are quite um, they're quite particular to the legal sector. I mean, for example, when we're onboarding clients as a law firm, there's things like entering into a cost agreement and you know, lots of GDPR issues mm-hmm. and signing documents off and all this sort of thing. How hard was it or was it hard for you to sort of get your head around those legal-centric elements of the pain points? I think, yeah, it definitely took some some getting used to and, and for first sort of personal development, it was very much you learn something new every day because as you say, you know, when you, you're dealing with the legal sector, everything has got to be right because, you know, we definitely don't want to be the reason that someone's not compliant or they're not adhering to the regulations of the industry. Um, but it's, it, you know, we, we do that day in, day out. So I'm very much... Uh, finally got my head around it all. Well, you, you definitely have because, <laughs> you know, the way you've 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 really, I mean, you've, you've had such an amazing year in terms of the way you've grasped a new role and a new business and we've had a lot of change in the business. Mm-hmm. Do, how, how do you compare the clients you've got now, the clients you've brought on board to, for example, clients in, in hospitality? Well, just, just in terms of how they are as as people and how you help them? How would you compare the two? Because they're both services industries, aren't they? Hospitality and and legal. Yeah, I think um, definitely the margins in hospitality were much smaller, so there wasn't very much wiggle room. Um, And I think, you know, there wasn't as much to consider um, in adhering to um, regulations and and policies and of the industry, so to speak. Yeah, it's a, it's a, Legal is 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 an industry where in order to excel as a law firm, mm. you have to be able to see the advantage of technology and you do have to be able to, pre- to be prepared to invest in it. I think one of the one of the, the, the problems that law firms have is that we've had such a period of unprecedented change. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, in in public publicly funded work, legal aid has been practically abandoned. Mm-hmm. Um, in what I would think of as litigation, you've had reform after reform, which has squeezed the margins. Yeah. Conveyancing, obviously there's issues now with the housing market and even in commercial and corporate, which I think are sometimes seen as um, the most lucrative areas. With there's still economic considerations at the moment. We've had Brexit. So law firms, I mentioned earlier, but I sometimes get a bit frustrated when I hear law firms refer to as, oh, they're dinosaurs, oh, they're very cautious. The reason why law firms are cautious is it's because it's been so difficult to see what the next three years looks like in terms of their practice, because you just don't know what the government or the economy or whatever it is going to do next. Very hard to make good decisions on technology in that sort of uncertain situation. Yeah, and that's why, you know, our clients come to us and they do put their trust in us that we... You know, we we understand the legal tech, we understand the market, and you know we understand the the positive effect on, as you say, you know, operational operationally um, margins. And actually, we live in a time now where if your tech isn't right, that you've got big problems. You know, nobody wants to be rekeying data nobody wants to have big huge admin teams that they're having to build out and you know in a lot of cases now if you've got the right case management system and and software added value products you actually find that you can you know will your team sort of you know or deploy them doing other things exactly it's focusing on the the sort of the roles of what the fee earners do day to day. It's more about generating business and driving the business forward as opposed to doing the administrative tasks that are time consuming and no one really gets up in the morning and thinks can't wait to do that. So you can kind of offload those now and have your tech do it for you. Podcast today is brought to you by Zeus Tech Solutions who provide dev on demand for law firms. When I was managing partner of a law firm, recruiting and retaining top tech talent was one of the biggest challenges. And worse still, because we didn't have the knowledge in the business to manage and coach a technical team, it was a constant cycle of frustration, downtime, lost revenue, and proclaim line dormant. Well, for the past five years, Zeus have looked after both of Spiring Group's law firms in the UK and Australia, and it's been a game changer. Now, we get all of our tech on tap from IT director to .NET developer. We get that whenever we want. Zeus provide the best use of tech to all of our fee earners with no recruitment fees and absolutely no nonsense. So if you're a law firm who are frustrated with the tech anywhere in the world, go to www.zeustechsolutions.co.uk and hit the live chat option and the answer to all of your tech solutions, however specific they are, is right there. Better still, if you mention that you heard about Zeus on the podcast, you will get a free health check for your case management system. So that's Zeus Tech Solutions, dev on demand for law firms, and now on with the podcast. That's right. I mean, there's there's three things there, isn't it? We're all interested. Number one is the technology. I mean, there's lots of talk at the moment, isn't there, about AI is going to come for people's jobs and, and, and all the rest of it. I would say with all technology, that's an, an excessive concern. I, I don't think that's true. The reason being is that I think that better tech allows you to give your teams more enjoyable roles. Mm -hmm. It allows you to deploy their skills in areas which add more value. And it also, the point you've made there, it allows them to enjoy their jobs more, which should really be helping with with retention. Absolutely, yeah. And obviously retention in the industry is a a big issue. Um, And I do know we've worked with a number of clients that have actually reduced the staff's working week. They've reduced headcount. but the the margins, you know, the, the, they're earning more now than they ever have done. And that's purely because of the tech that they've got in place. The staff are happier and essentially they work harder. It's a good news story, isn't it? There's no there's no downside to it. But you know, to be fair, law firms do need to make good decisions. And yeah. that's where I think 
it can, it can be difficult because there's mm-hmm. a lot of choice out on the market. I mean, I personally find at the moment there's a lot of dissatisfaction mm-hmm. around legal tech. Not exclusively. There's some great providers out there, some great products out there. But particularly around something like case management systems, what the feedback I get is that some of the systems that are most um, well-promoted and well-known, they're not in the cloud. They're not being frequently updated. They're not being particularly well-supported. There's a lot of frustration around the issue of support. People can't get changes made. They can't go on a development journey where they take what's out the box, but they then uh, make it bespoke to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, the, the one thing which really I just cannot understand is there are a number of big legal tech providers who don't have an open API. Yeah. So effectively, they are not only is their system not giving their clients what they aspire to, which is always understandable mm-hmm. because systems can't do everything, but they're not facilitating innovation in the clients. On the contrary, they're actually putting walls up towards it. And I cannot work out strategically how that is a long-term strategy for success. No, I think I think it's quite short-sighted. Um, and I think, you know, you, you must give your clients, and your customers, you've got to give them choice. And by using a platform that doesn't have an open API, it's almost like backing them into a corner. Um, and it's, you know, use our system or don't use it at all, yeah. which is 2023. And that's just not how no. the world works, it's especially in legal tech anymore. You know, you want to be able to pick bits of each system that you like and that work well for you, um, you, you know, and use it fluidly. Absolutely. I mean, if you think about it, technology now is, is all about connection, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So if you think about something like ChatGPT, you know, you can you can use the Microsoft API to link in with uh, PowerPoint and prepare, and, and ChatGPT can prepare a presentation. And you think to yourself, it would be so unthinkable for both Microsoft and OpenAI not to offer that yeah. ability to integrate. Yet, it seems to me that that's exactly the approach that some providers are taking in legal tech. I get why there's a there's an economic incentive for them to do it, particularly those providers who've got their own range of products. Mm -hmm. So they want basically to drive the client down the road to stay with their own products. Now, of course, there's no reason they shouldn't promote their own products, but I think it is short-termism in the extreme to think that clients won't get fed up with walls being put up rather than doors being opened. That's it. We, you know, we, we see it on a daily basis, and people are always looking at their options. And you know, you, you, we're just not living in a time now where you have to back your clients into a corner to, to make sure they stay with you. If you're providing a good service, and you know, development is is easy, accessible, and you know, there's, there's good client care there. There's no reason why they wouldn't stay with you. There's no need to to put anyone in a in a corner. I think that's right. And I, I also think that you actually can generate more goodwill yeah. by being quite selfless mm-hmm. and actually saying, look, we want your technology to work best for you. And uh, just, just I think, to be cooperative and to be a facilitator rather than like an agitator. Absolutely. I think, you know, in my role especially, I am very, very big on sort of referring into, you know, other systems, other products. Um, and I'll be quite honest with my clients, if there's not necessarily a service or a product that we've got that we can offer that they need, I will happily sort of refer them on to the, the, correct, the correct team, person, company that'll be able to help them. And that's how um, you grow your network as well, isn't it? Well, it is, yeah. And, you know, we, we get clients coming to us all the time, even though if they're not working with us directly, we're a point of contact that they'll come to first because they trust you know, our... You, it's probably like you, 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 they trust your honesty in terms of making referrals. Exactly, yeah. And when you when you do that... And it's time, you know, who's, you've got the time to sit and trial the market. Um, exactly. Uh, yeah. I had um, Dr. Louise Ashby on the pro, on the podcast quite recently. Um, Louise has studied the legal profession quite extensively. And one of the really interesting, really interesting conclusions she's formed, which is backed up solidly by data, is that whilst 
the um, diversity between men and women mm. in the legal profession has improved. What hasn't improved is the male and female mix at leadership level yeah. in law firms. It's still quite starkly tipped in the favour of us blokes. Um, and that's certainly my anecdotal experience of when I used to go around. I mean, I still do. You go to networking events or you go to awards evenings or business conferences. Yeah. There's loads of fellas. Um, is that something that, that you observed um, when you first joined the, the sector? Yeah, I do think it's very male dominated, um, especially, as you say, at leadership level. From my own experience, I do liaise more so with with men than than I do with women. Not to say that it's only men, but definitely more so. And I suppose you see, I, I'm the way I approach this issue is I look at it from the basis of practicality and also of my own experience because um, a number of our leadership team in, in Integrate of, of women, it's quite, it's almost 50-50. Yeah. yeah. And I can see just how, I mean, it's not just a, a gender issue. It's, it's, it's people with different experiences and different stages of, of their lives. But that mix is what creates that real creative, innovative, almost tension because people have different views. They have different thoughts, they have suggestions, and that's where great ideas come from. So when I talk about the reason why I think this is important, it's more because of the benefits I've seen from having different people from different backgrounds around the table. Yeah. It, I mean, do, do you, is it something we should worry about in terms of, because when Louise's point was, she wasn't so much saying the diversity around the top table in the legal profession is poor and that's what this mm. means. She was just sort of stating the facts. Mm -hmm. if, in your experience, in terms of when you're out talking to clients, meeting with people in the sector, is the fact it's quite male-dominated an issue or do you think it just is what it is? I think it is what it is, you know, for the time being. But, you know, we're, we're moving into a, a space where everyone has, has, has got equal opportunities and I think more firms especially are, are conscious of that and and making sure that the balance is right um so i think you know we might be at a stage now where it's maybe more male dominated but i think definitely moving forward in the foreseeable we'll, we'll start to see that even out yeah I, th I think so and i mean i just just one area i've always observed is that i think that the way networking and conferences and awards evenings and social evenings work i think it's um it's not it doesn't really fit for families mm -hmm. so the reason why i am not a, a prolific attender at the likes of awards and i mean could be the number of bloody invites me but <laughs> i think i could probably swing an invite if i absolutely wanted to but i like going home to me girls you know yeah. I, I like enjoying my time it's it's really important i like to uh, i like to be able to switch off as much as i can i like to be able to socialize focus on my personal well-being and i i sometimes feel that midnight finishes boozy dance floors you know traveling back to a hotel on public transport or your know, taxis out for that you're staying over. I just think it's going to be a time. This is not a male and female thing because I mean, lots of guys now, uh, you know, stay at home with the with the family. But I think it's it's anti-family. I, I think there's. I, I'm interested in whether there's better ways of doing it. Is this something you've sort of observed? Yes. So I think definitely that's one of the biggest things that I've noticed since coming into legal is the number of events, the number of awards, uh, conferences that, you know, lead into the night. And I know definitely for me, I've sort of put those boundaries in place because you definitely could be out every single night. Typically doing what you do. Well, yeah, you know, especially, you know, business development, it doesn't ever stop. You generate your own work. And, you know, um, I do think it's definitely a good way to meet people. Um, it, you know, it's more of a casual setting. And as we said, no one wants to be sold to. A conversation is just how I definitely prefer to do business. But in the same way, you must be mindful that it can easily tip over that that line where, you know, you're not necessarily putting your own 
well-being before just working flat out all the hours under the sun. That's that's right. I mean, it, a lot of these events are great, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. There's a number of people who put on terrific uh, awards and, and great conferences. I just, I, I, I'm just interested to know whether whether maybe we're moving into an era where or, or the audience, if I'm going to call them that, in terms of like the, the legal sector, whether they will, whether people want something that's more convenient, which is more adaptable to their business and their personal circumstances. Um, it's it's one of those whereby I personally, whilst I enjoy socialising, mm -hmm. I feel that business is usually done away from those events. Yeah, I mean, I'm not absolutely not saying that the, the events, as you say, they're not good and they're not worthwhile going to because they absolutely are. And it is nice to meet those, you know, prospect clients that you can't quite get hold of in working hours and you see them at an event and it's great. Um, but I, I do think it's definitely um, keeping it in between the hours of sort of nine to five, nine to six is... That, that's how I, the majority of work that I do it is between those hours, although it is nice to get out and, and see those those clients that you just can't get hold of. Yeah. And it's nice, and it's it's nice to see people. It's nice to have a dream with people. It's nice to have a meal yeah. with people. It's, it's just, I think, it, I personally feel when, when, I, when I look at the options that are out there, you are right that you could spend your whole life at conferences and a whole yeah. life at socials. And I enjoy doing business within a space that's very business orientated. And mm -hmm. I don't always think social type events are, but you mentioned there about um, being a business development, you've got to generate your own work. Now, obviously that comes with pressure. It, it, yeah. it can be stressful. <laughs> How do you deal with pressure and stress when it, when it happens? So I think it's, it's just about managing your time um, and, also reaching out when you, you do need a, an extra bit of support, that's okay to do that. I think it's taken me, you know, I've worked in sales my whole working career. So I'm now finally at a point where I realise that it is okay to lean on other people when when it's needed, when necessary. Um, but as long as you um, you work hard, and I would say as long as you're, you're looking after your, your pipeline, you always know, you sort your forecast and, and how to to manage that stress because you, you're preempting what, what's going to be coming in. And Are you someone who deal that, that, because I, I know exactly what you're talking about there when you're looking down the track and when things are good, you think, wow, you know. When I mean, things are good, things are great in and business then sometimes development. sometimes if it's looking a bit sparse, you yeah. can almost be in a situation where you're thinking, where's my next bloody job coming from? Yeah. Are you someone who finds it, easy to handle that anxiety or is it something which you've developed strategies to to combat it? I think I've definitely developed the strategies to combat it is what we'll say um, because it, it's stressful. It's a stressful job and there is always that pressure, always, you know, you've, but then I'm in a position now where I've built up a client base that it's very, you know, I've got a good relationship with all my clients and, and thankfully I, I work for, you know, Integrate. We offer a number of different products and can help service clients in a number of different ways. So it's just really about creating those relationships and, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and you, you're someone who's very gifted at that. I mean, I, when I was ever in that situation and I, you, you feel that anxiety, don't you? You feel it, like, oh, hang on, that's just the pipeline there is just not looking quite as good. And you know when you're in sales, of course, that there are lots of people relying on you because you can have the most gifted technicians, and we definitely have it integrate, but they need to be fed, don't they? They of need course. the clients, they need the quality of work. And then obviously there's the people who are just supporting the business in admin and, and marketing and that sort of thing. Um, have you ever tried meditation? I have, I have tried once and to my dismay, I was put under. Uh, so yeah, it worked very well for me. I should do it more, but I, yeah. I'm going to share with you, there's there's an app, which uh, it's Sam Harris's app, it's called Waking Up. I, I only started doing meditation um, about a month or so ago, but I'm, I'm pretty hooked. And the, the thing with it is, is 
when you, this issue, the reason I got thinking about this was you mentioned the pipeline. You're looking forward yeah. at what the next thing is. If it's like, right, we've got to increase our sales target. I want to increase my income. You know, and then you think away from work, you think, right, where am I going all the mm -hmm. next year? You're never quite in the now. Yeah. And that's what meditation encourages you to do, to maybe just think, well, that's not, none of that's relevant because we just now, now is the only thing we know. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that is that is the case. You're always on to the next thing. Something great lands, and then no as soon as it landed, you're on to the next, and you've always got your tunnel vision. Um, but again, that's why it's so important to put the boundaries in place yeah. to make sure when you're downtime, you're spending it with you know your family and your loved ones, and and you are enjoying that time, and it makes you appreciate the good times, especially you know nine to five, Monday to Friday. It it can be hard. Mm. Um, but, you know, thankfully, if you've got your, the right people around you, you it fuels you. That, that's right. And it's about who you surround yourself with. And I think there's an element of that at home. I also think there's an mm -hmm. element of that at work as well. Absolutely, yeah. I, I've always tried to recruit people who will both inspire me but also challenge me. Mm -hmm. But in a way which is, I, was, I would always describe it as non-political. Yeah. That there's no... Um, ulterior motive mm -hmm. that everyone is pushing in the same direction yeah uh, and i think it's it's one of the key things about leadership and i don't suggest for one moment i've got this perfect but to get a team together who are naturally have their own best interests mm -hmm. but are prepared to combine those with the best interests of the business and not allow any negative emotions to get in the way of what's what is is for the greater good yeah yeah no completely agree i think in order to have a successful team it definitely has got to start from the top and as long as everyone's values align yeah and you know and, and everyone gets on i think that's definitely um the recipe for for a successful business and yeah. i definitely know you know within our team and just bringing back to the point of, of of the pipeline you know we are thankfully i do work for a very innovative business that there's, there's very rarely something that can't be done um which again makes it so much easier to to be able to help and service our clients so i think that's a very interesting point you've made about the very rarely being the very rarely not being a solution. And do you know what? I, I've been in tech now long enough that the conclusion I'm reaching is that everything is possible. It's just time and money that get in the way. Yeah. So if someone ever says, if, if you have a, a problem that a client brings in and someone ever says that is just not possible to sort, they're almost certainly wrong. Mm -hmm. What they will, and, and, not just they're wrong, it probably isn't exactly what they mean. What they probably mean is the time and the money it would take to sort that problem is just unpalatable. And they could be right with that. Yeah. But I think one of the really exciting things about tech, and I, if I compare it to law, where the law is quite, um, it is or it isn't. It's the, the law is the law, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. If someone asks you for advice on something, you've got to give them the right advice. Yeah. And that will be based on case law, it'd be based on legislation or whatever it might be. In tech, it's all a lot more fluid and, and the solutions are, are always out there if you've got the time and money to source them. That's it. I think, as you've just said, you know, law is black and it's white, yeah. whereas tech is grey. Yeah. Tech's the grey area that sits between, that makes it happen. You know, it's just, can sometimes be a long road and there's just a couple of hurdles in the way, but you can always navigate around them and get to that end goal. Yeah. No, you, you can yeah, absolutely. So when you're talking to um, law firms now, is there any one particular or two or three particular areas of pain which are frequently raised with you? So obviously fixed costs are now in full swing. Um, so it's looking at making processes efficient, um, reducing sort of human input and, and making sure the processes are automated. Um, that's definitely one of the biggest things that we work on, whether that's with workflows, um, the onboarding, you know, looking at source of leads, all that sort of thing, and making sure that MI is, is correct and the data that you're reporting on is, is the data that you... It's massive, that, yeah. isn't it? 
Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I used to, um, this was, again, this was one of the areas which I didn't find legal tech products were very good at delivering around things like your management, it's information reporting, because that's the lifeblood of your performance of the business. Yeah. And one of the advantages I feel that I could bring to the table is that because I've lived and breathed that when I was leading a law firm, because I I knew that me understanding what the work in progress was, how long cases were taken to settle, how long it was taking us from settlement to case to bring the cash in. I, I, I understand why law firms desperately need this. And what has always surprised me, I'm not saying this in criticism of law firms, but because the tech doesn't quite do sometimes what the law firms want, they end up back on Excel. Yeah. And it's the worst of both worlds because you do have law firms out there who are making the investment. Some who spring to mind immediately who are spending a lot of money. Yeah. But the tech could be great from a functional perspective. But if it's not doing what the law firm wants to do, they might as well not bother. Yeah. You've got, you know, tech, there's no secret that it's, it's expensive. It is expensive, but the return on the investment is huge, you know, just for um, staff satisfaction. It is one huge area. And then, as you say, you know, the, the data that you're reporting on, you'd be surprised just how many firms don't ha are not reporting on the correct MI. So they don't actually, not too sure on sort of like limitation dates yeah. on whip, how long cases have been open. And you would think that is sort of the, the, the more basic, but the, then the tech also doesn't doesn't quite sit hand in hand and it sort of needs to to be able to work fluidly. I so think so. You've got a so. good overview. I think that's right. I think also the last sort of 20 years, the, 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 since I started practicing in uh, late 90s, there's, there's been a massive shift in law firms in them being... Um, that in the leadership principles being much more related to business than being related to like law. So the, I, I, I'm not sure that when I started in practice, whether the firm I was at, who were, who were quite an advanced firm for that time, mm -hmm. I'm not sure the extent to which even they looked carefully at things like case lengths. And certainly I wasn't aware of them being reported on. Mm -hmm. Whereas now I think, with with the advent of alternative business structures, with non-lawyers being able to invest in law firms, with positions like chief financial officer, mm -hmm. FD, becoming so much more pivotal. I think those are the key areas law firms want visibility of, and that's where tech can add value if the system is configured in a way that law firms want. Yeah. Let's say there's a uh, an Abbey from 12 months ago so let's say you could give advice now to you yourself or a version of yourself yeah. who is considering moving into the legal tech space now. What would you advise them is the, the key areas that they need to learn or focus upon in the first 12 months of business development? I think it's understanding the structure of a law firm and exactly what roles... Um, are applicable to who and then understanding where that those pain points might be you know if you're talking to a managing partner of a firm their their pain points are going to be slightly different to the fd or you know operations they're going to see the main overview whereas you're going to make sure your outreach is quite uh direct and and sort of funneled to exactly what those people need you know they're very busy yeah and you you don't want to waste waste their time so it's just about having that understanding and definitely just asking if you're not quite sure because they're all lovely people are very happy to offer advice and you know I think so you know I I find the legal sector to be one of the most welcoming and yeah. Um, generous with their time, yep. interesting people. Um, and I, when, I, when I hear people described as old school dinosaurs, all the rest of it, it gets my goat because law firms are to some extent a product of the way they've been treated by successive governments. Mm -hmm. And also in the UK, and perhaps 
other, I'm sure this would apply internationally. The fact that we have had an up and down political and economic climate for many years. Yeah. And I've, I always find, you know, you know, obviously the firms we talk to range from a uh, few people in a single office to six, 700 user yeah. firms. And there's such a mix in terms of everything from their levels of optimism mm -hmm. to their willingness to invest, to their positivity. But it is such a pleasure to help businesses who themselves are focused on helping people. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're all there for <clears throat> to achieve the same goal. Like we want to help our clients equally. They want to help theirs. And we work by the same sort of advice that, that we give. We work on ourselves. You know, it's, it's tried, it's proven and hence why we, we do what we do. Absolutely. Well, I need to let you go in a minute, but... What about uh, if we met again, which I, I hope we do. Well, we meet nearly every day, but if <laughs> I mean in a podcast environment um, in a year, what what are your hopes and aspirations both for integrators of business and for yourself in terms of your, your role? Just don't start talking about pay rises, for God's sake. <laughs> um, so my aspirations definitely for Integrate is that we will have double figures uh, for our client base using Legally Connected. Don't think we're going to have much uh, much problem in doing that with it being a sort of open API, cloud-based hosting. I think my aspirations for myself is that there'll be a couple of people working underneath me um, and we'll be growing a sales team and really doing that direct outreach to, to clients to grow the business and, you know, grow personally as well. Do you know what? I, I, I find growing team numbers to be one of the most gratifying parts. You're growing people particularly in tech, when the barriers to entry, I think, are lower. Because first of all, there's a diversity of role within tech businesses. And secondly, because it's not normally a regulated space, mm -hmm. it means that people don't have to have been at university for four years and achieved, you know, to become a lawyer or all the comparable professions. So no, I, I, I'm looking forward to that as well. I'm looking forward to us bringing people in, giving them a journey they can be proud of. And um, allowing them to share in the success we're going to have. So it's been lovely talking to you, and well yeah. done on the first year. Uh, it's been it's, you're like part of the furniture. You really are. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. <laughs> That's all right. You've been a tremendous guest. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for listening and watching, and we'll see you back here soon.